up, HSM? It's week five of our More Than Sex series, and tonight we are talking about the truth about marriage and sex. And our subtitle is God's Brilliant and Sometimes Frustrating Design for Marriage and Sex. You see, I'm operating from the place that each one of us only sees half of our life. Oh, each of us only sees our story in part. We don't have a full picture of what our life should look like. As people, we need God. God created us. He died on the cross for us. He rose from the dead for us. His love for us is so great. I was just reading in Luke today in my time with Jesus, and Jesus says, look, you are more valuable than anything, and God loves you. He says that God knows all of the birds, the sparrows that, that aren't even worth a penny. And God knows them and he knows you even more. This means you are loved by your creator. But the reality is when we read the Bible and talk about the conversations the scriptures have about marriage and sex, we're going to be frustrated at times. Because the Bible cuts against the grain of our culture. The Bible cuts against some of the desires, the feelings that we have in this immediate moment. Because God sees in full. God has the perfect picture of our lives and how we should live them. And so our job as Christians is to trust Jesus. And maybe you're not a follower of Jesus. And you can begin following him and trusting him because he loves you. And so I guarantee some things I'm going to share are going to be frustrating, but they're coming from God's truth because he loves us. Now, I love this picture. This is Sarah and I, my wife and I, on our wedding day 12 years ago. And I know you're looking at that and you're like, man, Eric looks like he's 12. We weren't 12, but we were young for sure. Now, over the last 12 years, what I want to share with you is what God has taught me through his word and what he has taught me through our experiences of being married. Now, before we jump into a conversation on marriage and sex, you may be watching this, and we're going to talk about this more in the next two Wednesdays at HSM, but maybe you're going, hey, Eric, as we're talking about relationships and marriage and sex, the reality is I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with some bigger questions. I, I'm attracted to the same sex, and I'm wondering, where does that fit into God's plan? Can I be honest with you for a minute? I think the church has done a really lousy job loving and caring for people who are attracted to the same sex. And I want to correct that and change that. I want to do my part. You see, we've done a lot of talking and not a lot of listening. And so if right now you're attracted to the same sex and you're, you're keeping that inside, you haven't talked with anyone about that, I would love the honor and the privilege to hear your story, to listen. In fact, I would love to invite you to, to text me at, on my cell phone number, 805-766-1072. And we'll keep it confidential because I just want to hear your story and I want to care for you and walk with you. Now, I want to start with a lie and a truth. As we talk about marriage and sex, I want to start with a lie. And the lie of our culture, and it's even seeped into the church, is this. There is one soulmate a perfect match out there for you and your life will be complete and fulfilled if you find and marry that person. That's why The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, which I'm gonna hate and love those shows, but that's why they've been going on for seasons and seasons. That's why you got Love is Blind on Netflix. That's why there's so many songs written about love because our culture is obsessed. In fact, we have created an idol, an unhealthy view of marriage and sex. And, and a lot of us live with this deep desire, this, this deep hope that if I find my soulmate, if I find the perfect person for me, all my problems will go away and I will finally be whole. I will finally be happy. Well, I want to tell you this and I hope it doesn't dash your dreams, but there is no soulmate out there for you. There is no perfect person the best you and I can do is as broken people who love Jesus to choose to marry someone who is also broken and loves Jesus. And together we will become more like Christ in 
a marriage. Now, I'm not saying don't pray for your spouse. God knows who you're going to marry, but he's not forcing you to marry someone. In fact, if there was a soulmate and a perfect person out there for you, then why would the Bible have so much teaching as we're going to see about marriage? If there was a soulmate, it would just be easy and natural. And if there was a soulmate, then you and I, when our marriage gets tough, when, when the relationship gets challenging and difficult, we might start thinking, maybe I married the wrong person. Maybe you've seen marriages fall apart because someone believed I married the wrong person. Well, I believe that, that this is a lie from our culture. And, and here's, here's the truth of scripture. The best love story is when one man and one woman out of a deep love for Jesus, choose to marry one another for the purpose of daily laying down their lives for each other and for the gospel. Y'all, that is sexy. Like, that is real. I remember when Sarah and I were just dating, we had finished watching this, this movie together. We were at the movie theaters, and, and as we were coming out of the movie theaters, Sarah turned to me and she said, Eric, do you still have butterfly feelings for me? And you guys, I know I was new to dating. I said the wrong thing. I looked at her and I said, sometimes I do. And I know that's the worst thing you could say. It's the worst thing. It was so bad for me to say that. But what I was trying to say to Sarah and, and where the conversation eventually went is, Sarah, I love you and I am choosing to love you. And sometimes the feelings are there, but there's times where the feelings aren't there. And yet I am choosing to lay down my life for you. As Sarah and I were preparing to be married, I was thinking about the reality that me becoming a husband was not a guarantee that I would always feel a certain way about Sarah, but that I was called to lay down my life for her and for the gospel together. Now, uh, let me frame our conversation. Here's where we're going, and then we will dive into each of these big ideas. I wanna talk about four biblical, frustrating, and brilliant truths about marriage and sex. Truth number one is this. Marriage and sex, well, let, me, let me go back and look at all of them. Number one, marriage and sex were God's idea first. Number two, joy comes when you die to yourself. Number three, sex is not gross or God. Sex is a gift. And number four, marriage isn't for eternity, but its wins will be. Let's talk about truth number one. Marriage and sex were God's idea first. In a marriage between a man and a woman, two equals become united as one. What's interesting about marriage and sex is it shows up in the very first pages of scripture, which were written at the beginning of human history. In Genesis 1, 26 to 28, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God had this idea, and then it says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Now, it's not just talking about God creating men, but it says in his own image, God created them, male and female, he created them. Now, this is profound. God created men and women equally. In this cultural context that this story, the true story of God was written, Oh, men and women were not equal. And I bet you can guess who was at the top. Men were the leaders of their society. And women were oftentimes treated as property at best. But into that culture, God's brilliant truth breaks through that actually every person, man and woman, is created in his image. And then it says this in verse 28. This is in the first chapter of the Bible. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, God said, have sex. Like literally, this is a command in scripture in the first chapter. 
Now, as we're going to see, it's between Adam and Eve within the context of a marriage. God's idea for sex comes forth. You see, sometimes we go, man, sex is just this, this, this thing that we think about a lot. Or, or man, uh, it feels weird to think about it in, in relationship to God or in, our, in, in talking about God. It was God's idea from the beginning. <laughs> it's not like humans have sex and God goes, what are they doing? God designed it. The story in Genesis continues in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper. We're going to talk about that word in a minute. A helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now, ladies, maybe you're hearing that and you're going, helper? Come on, like helper? That's, that's who I am? Well, let's look at the original language. Let's look at the Hebrew, which is what this story was written in. The word helper in Hebrew is azer, which usually was used in terms of divine assistance or military aid. In fact, God gets called our helper. And then the word suitable is neged, which literally means like opposite him or matching him. So, so when God says that he created a, a suitable helper, it means an equal. It means, it, it means someone who matches and is opposite of him, but equal in importance to him. You see, as we've, as we've discovered, sex was designed to be experienced and fully enjoyed within the safety of a lifetime commitment between a husband and a wife. And you ask, well, where is that in the text? It happens in the next part. Verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Which he's like, whoa, man, right? He sees this woman, whoa, man, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. This is the first marriage and it's in the context of marriage between a husband and a wife that sexual unity and intimacy is experience. I love what Matthew Henry says. He's like a modern day beaver or something. He said, the woman was not made out of the man's head to top him, not out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. When the Hebrew word one is used, the original word is akad. And oneness means permanence and passion. So when the story goes that a husband and a wife become one, it's not just talking about them having sex and becoming one in that way. It's talking about something larger that takes place. It's talking about a kind of permanence that they experience. As, as long as they're alive here on earth, they're in relationship with each other, but they also have passion for one another. I love using this text whenever I do weddings because God's desire for a Christian marriage is that it would be permanent, that it would last their entire lives, and that it would be full of passion, that they wouldn't become roommates, but that they would be passionately in love with each other. You see, God created marriage to be experienced between a Christian woman and a Christian man. It, it's, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to 
the Lord. You see, Paul doesn't say, you know, God, God's going to just make it crystal clear. He's just going to, uh, you know, all of a sudden a glow is going to be over a certain person. And that is the one person you're supposed to marry. Paul says, if you want to marry, you're free to marry, but make sure that they belong to the Lord. And students, I just can't tell you this enough. And we talked about this a few weeks ago in dating. It's so important that you date somebody who loves Jesus and that you marry somebody who loves Jesus. Because if not, they won't fully understand the very core of who you are. And every decision in marriage that you make ultimately centers around your most important values. And if your most important value is that you are a follower of Jesus, it's going to be difficult to align that with somebody who isn't. Truth number two, joy comes when you die to yourself. This is the frustrating aspect of God's word when it comes to marriage and sex. Joy comes when you die to yourself. Look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. As you, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This is the, this is the foundational framework that we are working from. That number one, I don't belong to me. That I ultimately, first and foremost, belong to God. That through Jesus' death and resurrection, he bought me back. He purchased me. He, he, he claimed me as his own. And now I belong to God. And so I need to make sure that my relationships, that my sexuality, that what I do with my, bodies is, with my body is in alignment with God. Marriage is an opportunity to mutually serve and value each other and honor God. Look at this revolutionary text. Look at this revolutionary passage from Paul. In 1 Corinthians 7 verse 4, Paul says this, The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. Trust her husband. Now, at this time, I know you read that and you go, oh, yeah, I don't know, that, that sounds a little interesting. At this time, this, this, this phrase right here would have been so commonplace. It was so normal. Because remember, again, this is written in a culture that didn't value women, that, that viewed women as objects, as property. And so a statement like this was commonplace. It was normal. But then Paul takes Christian marriage to the next level. He says, yeah, th th this is what everyone believes, but let me tell you, if you're a follower of Jesus, this part is also true. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. You see, Paul is saying true joy in marriage, true, true joy is gonna come when you die to yourself and when you give your life, when you give your body, when you, when, you, when you serve each other with your bodies, and this isn't just for women, this is equally as important for men. Do you see how, how the Bible elevates women as equals with men? One thing I believe is that marriage is a submission competition. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul teaches about marriage, and oftentimes verse 21 is left out. But it's important that we keep it in there, and I'll show you why. In verse 21, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then Paul says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Now, a lot of people like to quote that verse 22 and say, wives, it is your job to submit. But the reason I include verse 21 is because in the original language, in the Greek, that this letter was written in originally, it actually says in verse 22, wives also to your own husbands. In other words, Paul borrows the verb of submitting to one another for his teaching in verse 22. In other words, Paul does not disconnect submitting to one another and then wives submitting. He keeps them connected. In other words, it's so important that men and women understand that it is our job in marriage to submit to each other. 
Now, Paul is giving an extra teaching to women in the context that they find themselves in, but we cannot assume that he's only talking to women because in verse 21, he commands all of us to submit to one another. And it wouldn't make sense that my job is to submit to every other follower of Jesus except my wife. No, we're called to mutually submit to one another. The text goes on, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. But then he teaches husbands. He says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. God calls husbands to be the first to lay down their will and the first to sacrifice. You see, sometimes people will say, well, if, if a husband is the head of his wife, then that means at the end of the day, the husband gets to make the final decisions. Well, if we actually follow the text, if we follow what Paul is saying, he's saying that husbands, our call is to love our wives so much so that we would be willing to lay down our lives as Christ has laid down his life for us. In other words, if it comes down to a decision and a husband thinks one thing and a wife thinks one thing and they're both submitting to Jesus and they're both submitting to each other and they're both loving each other, it's actually the husband's responsibility to lay down his will and to be the first to sacrifice, to be the first to serve. God calls wives to willingly lay down their power and to choose to trust. And what's beautiful here is that in a Christian marriage, when a husband and wife are both committed to serving each other, when they're not going, okay, I want all of my needs to be met. It's all about me. But when, when I show up to the marriage and Sarah shows up to the marriage and my thinking is how can I serve and bless and lay down my life for Sarah and she's thinking the same for me, our marriage is amazing. We're dialed in. We're loving and serving and caring for each other. It's once we become selfish. It's when we, once we become self-centered that our marriage always tends to struggle. See, Truth number three comes out of that, and it's this, that sex is not gross. It's not God. It's a gift. You see, we live in a culture right now that will either tell you sex is gross. It should be avoided. You shouldn't talk about it. It's, it's awful. Or else you're hearing the message from culture that, that it's God that the most important thing in the world is who you're sleeping with, how many people you're sleeping with. That, that is the epitome of your worth and your identity. And I'm telling you, our culture has, in a, in a really incredibly unhealthy and idolatrous way, we have, we have made sex this idol that God never designed it to be. You see, God designed sex to be a gift. First thing I wanna tell you is sex was designed for marriage. In Song of Songs, which is a crazy book that's all about a husband and wife who love each other, I'm telling you, Solomon says some things in this book that are going to make you feel a little uncomfortable. I mean, he, he's talking about the beauty of his bride. And some of you are going, man, is it okay to be like physically attracted to the person I want to date and, and to my future spouse? Yes, it shouldn't be the only attraction. You should be attracted to their spiritual relationship with Christ, to, to their personality, to their character. But it's good to be physically attracted. And Solomon is physically attracted in Song of Songs as he's describing this beautiful love story. But it's important to remember that sex was designed for marriage. It says in Song of Songs, chapter two, verse seven, Oh, let me warn you, sisters in Jerusalem, by the gazelles, yes, by all the wild deer, don't excite love, don't stir it up until the time is ripe and you're ready. And what's implied here is that the time and the place for for love and sex to be stirred up is within the context of marriage. Er Erwin McManus said, you can have sex without giving love, but you can't have sex without giving a part 
of yourself. This is why Song of Songs cautions us on having sex outside of marriage because when we have sex, even if we don't love that person or even if we're trying to protect our heart, the reality is we will give a part of ourselves away. Sex should be intimate and personal. In Song of Songs 2.16, it says, My lover is mine and I am his. You see, sex should not just be shared with everyone. In fact, it should be shared exclusively between a husband and a wife. That's God's desire, which gets to our final point. Sex is exclusive within marriage. Song of Songs 4 verse 12 says, You are my private garden, my treasure, my bride, a secluded spring, and a hidden fountain. In other words, sex within a marriage is, a, is powerful enough to unite a husband and wife. But sex outside of marriage is dangerous enough to damage a person's life. See, God designed sex to be experienced between a husband and a wife. And when it's not, what, what power and unity could be experienced in the context God designed it for can ultimately bring destruction and pain. I love the way Rebecca McLaughlin talks about sex. She says, sex can bring joy and create life. But like a campfire in the living room, sex can also bring terrible hurt and heartbreak. Having sex before marriage can be destructive and having sexual relationships with a lot of people tends to make us less happy according to every study out there. Like eating too much candy, it might feel good in the moment, but the after effects can be miserable. God created sex to go with deep lifelong commitment. And researchers have found that having sex with just one person consistently does correlate with happiness. But when we pull sex and commitment apart, it hurts. I remember there was a young woman in a ministry that my wife Sarah and I were leading. And when she graduated and went off to college, we were really concerned for her. And I remember her making a lot of really bad decisions. And she began sleeping with multiple people. She began participating in drugs and alcohol. And, and I'll never forget one night about 11 p.m., Sarah and I were about to go to bed and we got a, a phone call from her. And so we answered and we said, hi, how are you doing? And she was just crying and sobbing on the other end. And she said, she said, I, I'm high on something. I don't know what I'm on. And, and I know I just had sex with somebody. I don't know who it is. And I just feel empty. You see, the world and the party culture told her that drugs and alcohol and sleeping with people is going to make you feel alive. But on the other end of the phone, I didn't hear someone alive. I heard someone dead inside. I heard someone who had become numb to the pain of experiencing sex outside of God's desire. As the creator of marriage and sex, God gives us boundaries to protect and bless us, not withholding, not to withhold something from us. This is a really big idea. When God gives us boundaries, and they may be frustrating right now in the moment, but when he gives us those boundaries, it's because he wants to protect you and I. It's because he wants to bless you and I, not because he wants to withhold something from us. And truth number four, our final one tonight is this. Marriage isn't for eternity, but its wins will be. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is God's mission for us. This is his commission to us. It's not to go find a husband and a wife and buy a pretty house and live with a, in a neighborhood with a white picket fence and live a comfortable life. That is not God's mission for your life. His mission and his purpose is that you and I would go and make disciples, whether we're single or married. 
In fact, there's a lot of religions, whether that's Mormonism or, or others, that believe marriage lasts for eternity, that marriage is God's ultimate goal for your life. But the Bible teaches differently. The Bible reminds us that as we move closer to God, we're going to move closer to each other, but the end goal is always moving closer to God. You see, marriage has an expiration date, but eternity with Jesus does not. In Jesus' own words, in Matthew 22, he says, You are an error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, this means when you and I die and then we are, we are raised to life as followers of Jesus, at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. So Sarah and I's marriage here on planet Earth, it has to be about something bigger than just our marriage. Because when we spend all of eternity with Jesus, we won't be married anymore. This means that a marriage that is all about Jesus is a marriage whose fruit will echo into eternity. I love this little glimpse of what a Christian marriage could look like. It comes to us in Acts chapter 18, where we meet this adorable Christian couple and look at what they did. Apollos began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila, a married couple, heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. This is a beautiful picture of what a Christian marriage should be. Here's Priscilla and Aquila who love each other, who are married to each other, and have made a decision that the focus, the mission of their marriage will be to advance the gospel, to tell people about Jesus. I'm just telling you from 12 years of experience, what, what I think is the most beautiful thing about Sarah and I's marriage is that at the end of the day, we want to raise kids who love Jesus. We want to help lead a church that loves Jesus. We want our marriage to be used by God to point people to Jesus. You see, our marriage is not an end in and of itself. But it's an opportunity to fulfill the calling, the mission that God has given us. And so students, these are the four biblical, frustrating, and brilliant truths about marriage and sex. That marriage and sex were God's idea first. This means he gets to call the shots on what marriage and sex truly are. Number two, joy comes when you die to yourself. The best marriages are made up of a husband and wife who love Jesus and lay down their lives for each other. Number three, sex is not gross, but sex is also not God. It's not, it's not something to be dismissed and it's not the most important thing in life. Sex is a gift that God desires for us to experience within the boundaries of marriage between a husband and a wife. And lastly, marriage isn't for eternity, but it's wins. A married couple that loves Jesus, that, that spends their marriage investing in other people and using their marriage to tell people about Jesus and help people follow him. Oh, those winds will echo into eternity. And that's the truth about marriage and sex. Well, as you break into your life group, we've got five questions that are up on the screen. I want you to, to go ahead and break into your life groups and have these conversations, answer these questions, look at these scriptures and have a deeper conversation about marriage and sex from a biblical, God-inspired perspective. I love you. Can't wait to see you. Have a wonderful time in your life groups.